Nous allons maintenant donc écouter la conférence de Denis Meadows, « Beyond the Limits to Growth ». Dear Denis. organized for me this meeting and welcomed me to Lyon and most important gave me interesting new ideas so thank you for that I hope tonight I will be able to give you a couple interesting new ideas but uh, President Fioni said, we need to find a new way. And that new way is not only ideas, it's also habits, a bit too. It's not our ideas that get us into trouble, it's our habits, and we need to make new habits. So before I start my speech, I'm going to give you some practice. I'm going to give you a chance to try some new habits. So I want each of you to do something. Please cross your arms. Look down and see which wrist is on top. And remember which wrist. Okay? I give you a hint. It's either left or right. Drop your arms. Excellent. Now, cross your arms. Look down and see which wrist is on top. And remember. Okay? Great. Now I'm going to ask you some questions. Everyone who had the left wrist up, uh, uh, so, First of all, let me see. Who had the same wrist up both times? Raise your hand. Almost everybody. So this is a research uh, university. Let's do some research. <laughs> Who had the left wrist up both times? Raise your hand. I did, too. Who had the right wrist up both times? Raise your hand. Ah, very interesting. Half and half. Some do it one way, some do it the other. It's a habit. And when you find out how to do a habit, then you do it the same way. It would be stupid if every time you need to do something with your hands, you have to decide, I'm going to cross left or right now. No, it's not useful. So you have a habit and you do it. Habits are good. They're very efficient. They save time. You don't have to think about it. You can worry about the job. But sometimes habits lead us into trouble. And I will talk tonight about how our habits, our habits of energy use, our habits of uh, resource use, of economy, of politics, got us into trouble. And then it's necessary to change your habits. So I give you practice. Cross the arms the other way. There are three important lessons in this. First, it's possible. <laughs> you can change your habits. Second, but only if you think about it. You have to spend some time to understand how to do it. And third, at first, it doesn't feel so comfortable. When you do your habits in a new way, at the first, it's not so easy, not so uh, pleasant. We have to change our habits of energy use. We have to change our use of water 
of soils. We have to change our habits related to population growth. It's possible, but we'll have to think about it. And you can be sure at the beginning there will be many people who say, I don't want to do it. It's not so comfortable. But now that you have had the practice, you realize it's, it's possible. This year, limits to growth became 50 years old. And this year, I became 80 years old. And both of us, both limits and I, decided, OK, we should look back and see what we learned, and we should look forward how to change our habits. And I will speak about this tonight. Because I'm a professor, I'm going to use some slides. You don't have to copy anything from these slides. I give the slides to the ENS, and if you, at the end, decide you really like these slides, you can just get a copy. So you are free just to, to listen. We need okay. So uh, you can see okay. <clears throat> After the limits to growth, the main challenge now how to solve difficult problems. In the last fifty years, we did manage to solve the easy problems. But now we have the difficult ones. And that is what I'm going to talk about tonight. 16 years ago, I uh, gave a speech at a university in, uh, I think, Vienna. And I said that in the next uh, 10 to 30 years, growth in population, consumption, and so forth will become negative. It's still true, but now we are 16 years closer. And I said that as a consequence of this move from positive to negative growth, we will see enormous change. Change in economic, politics, environment, and so forth. Now it seems trivial to say those things. But 10 or 20 years ago, it was impossible to imagine that the pace of change could come so quickly. If I said 20 years ago, there will be a global epidemic, there will be a war, a land war in Europe, there will be an energy crisis in Germany, uh, everyone would think it's impossible. But now we start to understand. And uh, this is important because the pace of change uh, causes us to have to deal with more and more problems. The number of problems goes up. This is a little systems uh, language I use. The arrow means causes, influence. So if the rhythm goes up, that positive arrow means that the number goes up in the same way. Increasing rhythm, increasing number. Decreasing rhythm, decreasing Fortunately, here in Lyon, you have a mayor who has a great capacity to solve problems. So he manages to keep the number of problems low. He doesn't think so, but we know. And this is important because if the number of problems goes up, then the time perspective starts to go down and people start to focus on the short term. And if they focus on the short term, their capacity to solve problems goes down. And if we aren't careful, this can become a 
positive loop, a reinforcing feedback loop. And the result is to increase the number of problems while at the same time decreasing the capacity. And that's important because we know one fundamental law of society. If society has to choose between order and liberty, it always will choose order and give up liberty. And that is one of the big challenges uh, facing our society today. I still remember 50 years ago standing up at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Believe it or not, that's me, <laughs> speaking about the first time we gave a report to the public about our study. And at the table, you see my team, plus Aurelio Pache, that very distinguished guy with the gray hair. He was president of the Club of Rome. And the most important person, you don't see her really, just around the corner from the podium is Donella. You see her hair is uh, st sticking out. And I was trying to summarize what we had done at MIT over two years. I was very, very afraid. I remember before the speech, I became extremely uh, terrified because I thought everything I want to say, these people, they already know, they already understand. It will be so boring for them that I'm uh, telling them these things. But of course, as we found out, none of them believed anything. And even now, 50 years later, those things which seemed so obvious to us in 1972 are still a subject of great debate. I was telling them about a simple global mathematical model built by my team at MIT over a 16-month period called World 3. It had five sectors, population, resources, uh, copper and uh, so forth, the pollution, persistent pollution. This is uh, pollution which lasts for a long time, like radioactivity and uh, certain chemical compounds and so forth. Agriculture, production of food, and uh, the industrial sector. Our contribution was to find some basic laws in each of these five sectors and show their interconnection. Uh, by current standards, this is such a trivial model. Uh, a good climate model today will have millions of equations. This model had about, I think, 150, 180 equations. And it led to three reports. The first one is our subject tonight, limits to growth. Uh, a pop, so-called popular report, about uh, 120 pages. And then followed the next year by a collection of papers which we had generated during our study, scientific papers, called Toward Global Equilibrium. And then finally, uh, in 1974, our so-called scientific report. It's a big 650-page uh, technical detailed report which lets you, anybody, reproduce, understand and reproduce uh, all our results. We were hired by the Club of Rome to do number three. But finally, uh, the club decided it wanted number one. And I think actually, I said today, I spent more time writing the third book than everyone in the world together spent reading it. It actually would have been faster if I bring everybody together in the same room and just talk to them instead of trying to write it. From these three books, we identified 12 different possible futures because it's impossible to predict the future of a social system. Since man is an actor in the system and behaves in ways we can't predict, 
you can't know which way it will go over the long term. We modeled from 1900 up until 1970 in order to compare our model with historical data. And then we said that one possibility is what we might call sustainable development, where resources, population, uh, food, and so forth, finally stop growing and come into a balance with global limits. But there is another possibility. We don't pay attention to the limits and continue to grow, and then there will be overshoot. In 1972, we couldn't make a prediction which it will be. We said, here are 12 different possibilities. Decide which one you like, and then act to achieve that outcome. <clears throat> but now, looking back, many groups, scientific groups, have decided that uh, this second run is actually the more accurate. Uh, for example, uh, Graham Turner, working in Australia with the scientific team, concluded that well, you see what he concluded. So I can repeat this in a quite simple way. In 1972, which and here is shown to be the present, there were two possibles. One, to stop growth in balance. The second, to continue growing as fast as possible. Now it's 2022, and we chose the second path. So now we still have two options. One is to come back down into balance with the global limits, and the other is to keep trying to push growth as fast as we can until finally the system uh, is impossible. So 50 years after the book, it's a change from slow down to get the back down. And ENS is a problem solving university. So you are learning how to solve problems. And during your lifetime, it will be this battle, how to get back down in a way which is peaceful, equitable, between rich and poor, which leaves the planet with some of its genetic richness and leaves some resources for the future. That's, that's the challenge. In order to do that, uh, we need uh, two ideas. First, uh, we need to learn how to solve difficult problems. And to do that, as you will see from my speech, we need to understand the difference between adaptation, which is problem solving, and addiction, which is problem creating. Let me show you a simple problem. These are the ones we've already solved. So here's my scheme. This is time. We have a goal now. It's at the bottom uh, left. And our objective is to move up two possible solutions. One solves the problem. The second makes it worse. And here's the next election. If you will want to be reelected to office, which one will you pick? That's clear. You pick the green one. It solves the problem. And plus, in the short term, your voters know that you're doing a good job. We solve those problems. Now we have difficult problems. Same thing. We want to go from low to high, two possibilities. One actually solves the problem. The other makes it worse. And this is the next election. Or it's the next time you're, as a corporate president, you have to face your stockholders or it's the next time as a student you have to pass an exam, or the next time as a person you have to stand on a scale to see how much do you weigh. 
It's many things. And in each case, of course, there's a tendency to do the thing which makes it look good in the short term, even though that gives you an addictive response. Now, what do I mean by addictive response? Imagine you have problems, and they affect the health of the system. So you see my arrow, it means problems affect health, and they, the negative means they move in opposite directions. More problems, less health. Less problems, more health. But we don't know the health of the system immediately. Uh, we have to wait in order to see it. Uh, you can have cancer for 20 years before you see that you aren't healthy. You can print money for a decade before you decide that it destroys your economy. You can pump water out of the ground to feed your plants for several decades before you find that you don't have any more water. So there's a delay, very important delay, between the health and the perceived health. We have goals. We have uh, some desired uh, level of health. And when we compare the perceived health to the desired health, there's a difference, of course. When there is a difference, we take action. And the action has consequences. In an addictive response, the consequence makes the perceived health look better. It's like printing money. In the sh so you know, you're going to solve your energy problem in Europe this winter by printing money so people have more money to buy energy, therefore the energy won't cost so much. But this is an addictive response. It doesn't give you energy, it only gives you perceived health. And with the addiction, the uh, consequence makes the real health of the system worse. So the negative loop, the control loop, is around perceived health, which you keep low or high, but meanwhile making the system worse and worse. This is uh, complicated, but there's a time graph showing uh, the action problems perceived health and so forth. <clears throat> the key point here is, although you manage to keep the perceived health quite high for a while, it takes more and more action to do it, and meanwhile the real health is going down. That's the addictive response. We need to create an adaptive response. It's quite simple in theory, although of course very difficult in practice. To go from addiction to adaptation means first to eliminate the action which makes things look better. And second, now watch that little arrow up there next to health of the system. We need to find actions which have consequences which make the health of the system really better. When we do that, we create a new loop. This is now a problem-solving adaptive loop which works for us. It applies to climate, to energy, to soil erosion, to crime in the city, uh, and so forth. So it's, for me I, and my students, the big challenge over the coming years to find the concrete examples of where now there is addiction and we have to change the system in these two ways, to make it into adaptation. When we do that, we have a system which by and large can maintain its health. When there starts to be a problem with health, the perceived health goes down, you take action, it has consequences, which brings it back up. And so uh, this is the challenge for the future. I speak in academic terms in very general because in this audience there are economists and lawyers and doctors and so forth. But in each field there are concrete, specific applications of this approach. I know in my own 
uh, self, in my house, in my town, in my profession. I have worked systematically to identify where I'm doing something addictive and convert it over uh, to adaptive health. And now I finish with uh, one more simple exercise, which actually is the most important point of my whole speech. I'm going to ask you to do something. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three, slowly, and then I'm going to say, clap. And precisely at that moment, when I say clap, I want everyone here to clap your hands one time. I'm not, oh, not yet. I'm not trying to get applause. This actually is a, a serious uh, exercise. So I, just to make sure that you understand, <clears throat> I'm going to count to three slowly. One, two, three. Then I'm going to say clap. Precisely at that moment when I say clap, you all clap your hands. And if we are successful, outside they will hear one single large noise. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three, <laughs> clap. <laughs> this is actually the most important point of my whole speech. Actions are more important than words. I took, uh, and I have, I'm a professor, I have to tell you more about this. Right? <laughs> so, I told you what to do. Everyone understood what to do. You wanted to do it. You were eager to do it. But as soon as my actions were different from my words, you pay attention to my action and not to my words. It's the same for you. I hope I gave you tonight some new ideas but if you go out and behave in the same way as before, it won't have any use because people will pay attention to your actions, not to your words. Thank you very much.